Good afternoon all. Uh, welcome to WMG Steel Group uh, uh, Colloquium. Today we have a great speaker and it is my pleasure to introduce uh, um, my colleague um, and uh, Dr. Martin Strangwood. Um, Martin graduated in uh, uh, Natural Sciences from University of Cambridge and later he obtained his uh, PhD uh, under the supervision of uh, Sir Professor Harry Badesia and his PhD thesis is uh, uh, prediction and assessment of weld, micro, weld metal microstructures. After obtaining PhD, Martin worked uh, three years at the UK Atomic Energy at Harwell Labs, developing new metal matrix composites and structural intermetallics. Later, he joined University of Birmingham as a lecturer, where he contributed extensively to the, to the teaching program, as well as established uh, phase transformations and microstructure modeling and failure analysis, collaborating with many organizations and universities. He now combines part-time positions at Birmingham as well as with Steel Research Group at WMG. Martin has extensively done extensive work in, uh, in metallurgy as well as published in uh, reputed international journals. And today we are going to hear from Martin on the topic of through process effects, how far upstream needs to be considered for microstructure modeling of steels. Thank you, Martin, for accepting our invitation and for your time. And floor is yours now. Part of this um, is that you mentioned my, my PhD with Harry. Uh, that was pretty much on solid state transformations uh, and the formation of acicular ferrite. Uh, and so during my career, I have drifted upstream because of the, the things I'm going to be talking about in the next uh, next period of time. Uh, and so it, it's really trying to highlight some of the features that uh, the researchers, uh, up and coming researchers doing their PhDs might need to consider when they're, they're doing their work. And more importantly, trying to, to design new alloys. So, um, a few years ago, I did the uh, comprehensive course review at Birmingham, and one of those was, well, if we're teaching material scientists, what do we think they do? Uh, and material selection was was one of the the main uh, activities that we felt material scientists should be competent at. And and trying this slide to go from prehistory to the 21st century. So going through the, the natural materials and so the, the, the Stone Age and the use of wood and flint, um, starting to then see the iron and bronze ages as, as alloying becomes uh, possible. Uh, and that's going to be largely trial and error and extensive experimentation coming through. Um, but then microscopy pops up and we can actually examine what we've done to the material and, and start establishing relationships between desired properties and um, the microstructure, the microstructure to the composition and the processing parameters. And so we're in the fortunate position now that we can actually design uh, microstructures, alloys and composition routes from thermodynamic or kinetic models or machine learning if there's enough data there. Um, and so that that then starts to point the question, well, how much information do we need and, and what can we use? I mean, thermodynamic models are very easy to use to, to give us equilibrium. Um, gets a bit more difficult when we put in kinetics and move away from equilibrium. And unfortunately, that's where most of the interesting properties are. So part of this is to, to try and highlight what reliable information we need, where we don't need to spend a lot of time characterizing or, or getting that uh, experimentation sorted and where there are features that need to be yeah, looked at in more detail so that we have better um, confidence in those data and the information that come from those data in terms of 
giving us microstructures, compositions, and optimizing those with the processing available. So if we take um, equilibrium, well, the, the liquid state is, is going to be close to equilibrium, and, and that will be representing a state function. And, I, and I'm taking equilibrium as uh, the potential for different elements in different phases, or all elements in different phases are equal. Temperature and pressure are constant everywhere. I realize that there will be some uh, assumptions in that in terms of free surfaces, interfaces, and also external fields. So I'm not really considering the application of magnetic and electric fields. Um, so this is really looking at, at bulk processing. And a lot of what I will be looking at is a more recent work in the complex nine chrome power generation steel. So those would be um, in some cases sand sand cast to shape if we're looking at shaped components. So the, the liquid will be um, where we're starting and we can assume that that's an equilibrium. And then way off in, in the end of life, the alloys, particularly if they're creep resisting steels, will be approaching a metastable equilibrium. They'll they'll have precipitates in there. Those precipitates will have grown over time and they will be large and widely separated. So there, although there will be a driving force for them to carry on coarsening, that will be re relatively limited. So it's not a true equilibrium, but it, it may be the closest that we get to an equilibrium. Once we start considering the processing route, though equilibrium tends to go out of the out of the window fairly quickly. So if we take casting, um, this is where, as a, as a shape casting, you're likely to get a large range of cooling rates. That will depend on size and shape. Uh, there will be a macro structure which comes from the location. Is it a chill, a columnar, or equiaxed? Um, there will be solid to liquid partition of elements, and that's what I'm going to concentrate on, what the role of segregation is. And then there'll be a microstructural scale, and there'll be a cleanliness. So is, it, is it an air melt or is it vacuum melt, in which case there may be other inclusions in there? So uh, casting will introduce, unless carried out at a very slow rate, such as meteors, uh, it will introduce a, a disruption in that equilibrium. So although we may be able to use thermodynamic equilibrium thermodynamics for the liquid, once it gets cast, the structure becomes much more complex, inhomogeneous, and um, that's where we're starting to consider some of the effects here carrying through the rest of the processing route and indeed the, the performance in service. So if it's not a shaped casting, there will be some hot forming process. So we'll have reheating and thermomechanical deformation. And, and in a lot of cases, this will carry out quite a bit of the um, homogenization. So we will see desegregation to some extent. Um, that can be enough to make the material fine enough scale to behave as a, as a uniform material on the scale that we need to consider for the, the subsequent processes. So we have a lot of deformation, there's a lot of time at temperature, then that can drive the diffusion processes to give us desegregation. Those will depend though on the heating rate, the time temperature, deformation schedule, and will give variations in crane size, potentially stored energy, definitely segregation and, and precipitation. So there are knock-on effects from that processing. If it's a shaped casting, we're really left with reheating. And so that will have a much reduced desegregation and homogenization effect. And I'll come back to that later on when going through the, the nine chromes. Um, often there's cold forming, not always, uh, but then we're <coughs> excuse me, seeing texture, stored energy, grain shape. We're looking at uh, 
defamation processes, a number of passes that are carried out. Will we see uh, lubrication issues, so strain and strain gradient, there'll be dislocation structures. If you change the amount of stored energy, if the material has different stacking fault energies, then the different dislocation structures will vary, and that will affect recrystallization processes, uh, and therefore grain size and orientation distribution, so what texture do we get at? So, um, generally, not a lot of reduction in the um, amplitude of composition variations, maybe an increase in the uh, inhomogeneity of the grain structure, uh, but a refinement of the scale, the spatial scale over which these variations take place. So this can help the material behave more uniformly, although it doesn't tackle the, the, the root cause of segregation. Uh, and then there'll be annealing, and that's where you get recrystallization, the stored energy differences will um, come out uh, in terms of driving recovery, recrystallization and grain growth will be a greater dependence, a greater interest in texture formation. So we'll again see grain size and orientation distributions, variations in precipitation, if you've got differences in the distribution of alloying elements that form precipitates, then you would expect a difference in the precipitate distributions between what were originally solute rich liquid and last liquid and uh, solute depleted initial dendrites. So we still have uh, differences in composition profiles that are coming out there. Generally, the temperatures are, are low enough that we don't see the substitutional alloying elements. Uh, redistribute significantly within an annealing process. And then they're put into service. So often the components will have a range of microstructures and that corresponds to a range of properties, depending on size, position in that component, its shape and its processing history. I take the example of um, power generation steels such as grade 91, often what you're told about this entire path is the final normalizing and tempering situation. So the differences in the process parameters will mean that you're somewhere differently along the various paths between equilibrium in the liquid and final equilibrium at use temperature. Uh, and so therefore, those parameters of normalization and tempering temperature and time will have a different effect depending on what the prior processing is. The question is whether that is a significant effect and needs to be considered. So to summarize, if we concentrate on solidification segregation, although there are different sources of inhomogeneities, but these are the ones that tend to come furthest upstream and so the ones that would need to be dealt with first if designing an alloy and its processing routes. We're going to see differences in the driving force, so the transformations and precipitation leads to varying microstructures and properties. The deformation behaviour will differ, so if we have cold deformation and there's a variation in the solid solution and precipitation effects, will get differences in the stored energy and that will affect the potentially affect the uh, recrystallization behavior um, but we'll tend to see grain size distributions texture distributions uh, as well as other effects so you can imagine that segregation at surface exposed uh, conditions would affect the corrosion resistance but I'm going to principally look at the mechanical properties and the microstructure along the route that I've just described. So this is um, some results from Debele Chakrabarti's PhD at Birmingham before he went to, to the IIT in Karakpur. Um, and uh, this is building up the understanding of these uh, features and their effects that that I um, gain through the work of, of the PhD students and postdocs, um, and talking to colleagues uh, as well. 
Uh, and this is really um, starting to think about where we might need to consider this. Um, and this is not a cast component. The microstructure there is for a raw component. Cast products we'll come back to because they are the ones that have the least homogenization. But this is a this is a raw product that has been hot rolled. And uh, you can see that there's a very bimodal distribution. So if we look at the histogram, there's a MECD there. Uh, and there's a, a fine bimodal distribution, and that's these fine grains here. But there's a banded structure that's come from the casting solidification, which segregation, uh, which has been drawn out. So we have regions which, in this case, are, are niobium, manganese, carbon rich, the carbon going into the second phase. But then we've got um, this is a, the rich phase for niobium and um, manganese. Uh, and so we see fine grains where there's a lot of pinning. And we see coarse grains where there's much less pinning. And those coarse grains are um, two to three times or have a mode value that's two to three times that. And, and this indicates that if we were to take, say, a much smaller micrograph, let's say we took it onto high res SEM rather than optical, we could look here and go, there's a huge grain size. And then we look here and it's a much finer grain size. So Part of this is highlighting that if these effects come through, you do need to be con, um, mindful of what area you look at when characterizing materials and also the different areas. So there's the difference in the solute depleted and the solute rich material. How does that affect the properties? Well, that can be um, dependent on what properties you look at. So, so Debelay was particularly looking at, at fracture behavior. So he was looking at the fracture stress. And, uh, and if you have a uniform fine grain size, so this is a low reheating temperature, then you have good values and a reasonably tight scatter in values. If reheating went to much higher temperature, you end up with a uniform coarse grain size and Again, similar sort of scatter, but as expected, lower values because you've got a lower, uh, larger grain size. In the middle, though, sort of temperatures that were shown, gave the microstructure shown on the previous slide, much larger scatter, twice the scatter in the, in the fracture values, uh, and, and actually forming two groups. Uh, and we can start to think that these groups might be related to the, the um, notch uh, location. So if you were to sample large grain area with the plastic zone around the crack tip, you could get this cluster. And if you're in the fine grained area, you might be here. And of course, there'll be plastic zones that sample a mixture of the two. Uh, Claire and I also had a, a student, Li Ping Zhang, who I haven't put any images from, but she looked at the effect of banding on the inclusions. So she had large titanium rich inclusions. They were banded because they formed in the liquid and were pushed into the, the intergenerative regions. And again, there was a, a periodic variation in the Sharpie energies, depending on where the plastic zone from the Sharpie notch uh, interacted with those um, Inclusions, if the peak stress was close to inclusion, you got very low values. If it was further away in the middle of a band, uh, away from the inclusions, then the values were much lower. So those are sort of deleterious effects of, of this banding. Um, this is a, a Sharpie image from uh, Rachel Punch's PhD, uh, and she was looking at uh, Part of her, her work was looking at splits, and you can see these splits, and these are these are beneficial, but they're very orientation dependent because they're giving uh, fracture events at 90 degrees to the main fracture face, and so they are increasing the energy absorption. And again, you can see they're regularly spaced, and that comes from a mixture of the uh, spacing of the segregation, but also then the stress patterns. But it, 
these break up into a series of effectively mini uh, Sharpie samples. Uh, and the final example that I'll, I'll go through is, um, is Fei Wang's work, and he was starting to look at how the uh, abnormal brain growth. So Debelay was looking at segregation giving um, bimodal, so bands of coarse grains separated by fine grains. The abnormal are isolated coarse grains, and so they're they're less dependent on segregation, although they do tend to show a, a relationship to segregation. Uh, so this is again uh, a cast material, but this is just the reheating stage. So there's, there's no mechanical deformation, uh, which is why the grain size is so large. Uh, but you can see here up to about 1170, then the, the material behaves quite uniformly there's not much grain growth and we have here the average grain size in purple the mode grain size in blue they're very similar and then we have the 90 and 95 percent uh, area fraction grain size and they're reasonably consistent but there's a there's a step comes in at 1170 where the larger grains start to deviate from the average or mode grain size, and that increases on going to higher temperatures. So this um, unpinning of grain boundaries by dissolution of uh, pinning particles in the solute depleted regions starts at this temperature range and then continues here. So it's identifying processing windows where the risk of getting abnormal grains uh, can be related to the segregation behavior. So that, that's some examples. Um, what it should show is that when we're looking at segregation effects where they're significant, then they come in grain size and precipitate distribution, but they tend to affect the large end of those distributions, um, particularly for grain size. And so if we're looking at macro or micro hardness, then that tends to average out the effects. So uh, hardness is not particularly sensitive to segregation effects, but things that are associated with um, fracture and end of life, so toughness measurements, Debele used the, the fracture stress. Um, uh, Rachel was looking at Sharpie and therefore the energy absorption, so toughness measures, and then the creep life where that's going to be associated with creep damage around strain concentration. Those are much more sensitive. So if we were really just after hardness, we wouldn't need to bother. Uh, so there's less of a dependence if we're looking at yield stress, but tensile stress, toughness, creep. Um, we haven't looked at fracture, uh, fatigue in any great detail in this, but we would expect that um, the fracture toughness limiting the end of fatigue life, maybe not initiation, but the end of fatigue life would be another one where these issues may be important. Um, the other problem is that in a lot of cases we're dealing where we're not getting the processing history. So we'd like the full, full um, material passport, if you like, of the, how it was cast, what was the size of the casting, what was the cooling rate, so the material, mould material, was pre the reheating history, the hot and cold deformation. Ideally, we would have all of those, but in a lot of cases, if we're looking at legacy material, that those in data may not exist and not be available, or um, there are commercial issues that mean that all of the details are not available. So we need sometimes to work out what we need to do in terms of characterization of the material to assess this inhomogeneity. So what would we need to do? Well, the very basics would be, as I've mentioned uh, in passing, we need to look at a large enough area. So if we're looking at grain size, then optical, as Debele has got here, EBSD is very good for determining grain size, gives you extra information on orientation and grain size, uh, grain boundary misorientation. 
but it samples a smaller area. So you need to consider, have you sampled enough area? Do you have enough grains to give you a nice smooth distribution, whether it's uni -bi or abnormal, uh, bimodal or abnormal? Um, and have you sampled solute depleted and solute rich region? So it goes back to being a little bit more critical of your own results in the same way as you would be critical of of literature results, but also checking the literature. Do, do the authors indicate that they've sampled enough area that you believe that the grain size distribution would be um, reliable? Uh, and presenting grain size distributions, not just the average grain size, because the average grain size here would be dominated by this value whereas the fracture events are probably dominated by these values, at least in some of the cases that they're able to take. Um, so that's grain size. What about precipitates? Well, I'm going to split these into inclusions and large precipitates, and Leaping's work showed that there was an effect of, of precipitates, and this has been followed up in the in grade 91 power generation steel by Shahid. Uh, University of Warwick, so moving institutions. Uh, Jeff West is the, the principal supervisor, and I've come on latterly just to, to look at the segregation work. Uh, but that's looking, he's looking at uh, various grade 91 uh, samples which show different creep lives. Um, and creep damage can form at manganese sulfides or other inclusions. I mentioned that titanium rich inclusions get pushed into the liquid. So uh, you need to consider these inclusions because they might act as nucleation sites for things like manganese sulfide or even things like niobium carbonitrates in steels. So we need distributions and we also need to sample sufficient areas, both are solute rich and solute poor. And this is the, the grip end with a machine thread left-hand side of uh, a creep sample for uh, a forged grade 91. And you can see in this uh, mapping, the SEM EDS map, you see regions which are rich in manganese. And this is shown for other alloying elements as well. So chrome, vanadium uh, in this steel uh, molly, but, but manganese shows it quite nicely. Uh, uh, and you can see this region five is a solute rich area uh, because it's forged. The um, solute rich areas are not drawn out as in rolling, but they tend to give uh, more cloud like distributions. Uh, but the solute rich, solute depleted, and then Shahid's gone in and you can see much larger manganese sulfide inclusions in uh, area five, the solute rich, than in area six. There's still some red particles, but they're much smaller. And therefore, the risk of creep damage or um, toughness effects is greater in the solute rich than the solute poor. This is SEM, but you can see that uh, Shahid's looked at a, a good area, you know, 36 square millimeters. So he's sampling enough area and he's doing a sensible thing of sampling solute rich and solute poor. When we come to fine precipitates, then that's high resolution SEM. So the area sampled in a given time goes down or TEM. Uh, and that has always been an issue. You know, like back when I did my PhD, is have I looked at enough material in the TEM to actually be confident that the results I've got are representative. And in those days, it was uh, jet polishing, so you couldn't really be precise about where you got your thin area from. You were usually just thankful you got some thin area to look at. Um, so fortunately, I had some homogenized samples to work on to start with. Uh, nowadays, the greater availability of FIB machines means that you can pre select precise regions and so you can sample uh, solute rich and solute poor 
regions of the material. So that sampling issue is less of a, of a problem. It's then making sure that you do sample enough area to give you the, the distributions and give you the results that are representative. Extraction replicas are very good in giving you composition of particles and allowing you to do uh, diffraction work, but they do lose that site specificity. So you have less confidence that what you're getting is coming from solute rich or solute poor because they're not really large enough areas in most cases that you can mask them off and just do a replica from those areas. So um, less useful in terms of situations where the, the precipitate distributions might be significantly different. But you can um, get those data. So back to, to Shahid's work, here is another sample he looked at which was extruded uh, and that gives you these nice lines where you've got if we take this high uh, solute rich area it's rich in molly chrome niobium and vanadium so all of the, the strong carbonitrite formers are uh, concentrated in these bands and that's where you're going to get your creep resisting m23 c6 and mx come out um, whereas the blue regions are depleted and so will ha not have the same number density or area fraction of precipitates. So there's a clear composition difference and by using high resolution SEM, Shahid's been able to see those precipitates um, and because these are crept samples that have been in service, those M23 C6 are started to convert into larvae phase and that's useful because larvae phase is very easy to see in the SEM which means that you can readily do large areas and make sure you get the statistics needed to give decent data for modeling work or for design work and when you do those careful experiments here you see Shahid calls a solute rich positive and solute poor negative but you can see a big difference in the number density a reduction in the that effect when you go to the gauge length of the creep sample but in the head very big difference not much difference in mean or mode size a little bit more once it's been through the the extra heat treatment of the uh, creep test but a very clear indication that segregation is modifying the um, precipitates, the fine submicron precipitates, in this case larvae. So. so there are situations where segregation persists and affects a later processing and more importantly the, the properties. So um, how do we control it? And so we, in order to control it we need to know how it arises uh, and how it can be then dealt with either avoiding it, you know, prevention is better than cure, but if you know how uh, large it's likely to be, what you can do in terms of thermal or thermomechanical treatments to remove it. And a lot of the, the work here uh, formed the basis of Dai Yu Zhang's PhD at Birmingham, and so you'll see a lot of the, the information on uh, images will be credited to, to her thesis. So we've got dendrites in the early stage schematically and there's flow in the liquid. Um, if these liquid channels get cut off, uh, closed off, you can get things like center line A and V segregation. So the macro segregation, which is much more fluid dependent, fluid flow dependent. Uh, and this is very difficult to cure by heat treatment because it's over millimetres or even metres in some extreme cases. What's more interesting for me as a solid state uh, metallurgist is where you get liquid pools trapped by growth of the dendrites. So these would be secondary dendrite arms which have grown from here to here to fully enclose the liquid. And then you get solidification of that. You get composition enrichment here 
and then you have something you're able to do in terms of diffusion afterwards. So this is a, a BIM WMG cast for a nine chrome base steel. Uh, it's on its side, so this is the base of the mold. And you can see the V as the columnar grains have come from the base and meet those coming from the sides. And then this V at this end is where it goes into the um, diverging part where the pipe is accommodated. But right down the center, you can see clear porosity. So this is, these are interdendritic regions, so solidification porosity rather than gas porosity. And in this case, manganese rich particles. So center line segregation. So this is um, something to be avoided. It's clearly shown in these XRF maps. Um, and the gaps here are just where the samples were cut to make them easier to prepare for the XRF. Um, we are sampling, as you can see from a three centimeter micron bar, a very large area. So there's no problem with getting the, the statistics of what's a reliable composition or grain size. Um, so Harry with Ed Pickering looked at macro segregation and came up with a criterion for reducing that through composition control. So um, I would direct you to, to Ed's thesis and his subsequent work at Manchester for that. I will concentrate on what's happening here, which is where we're getting micro segregation. So that's on the scale of um, up to a few hundred microns rather than this scale, which is three centimeters. And this is from Adam's work. So Adam's a, a PhD student at Warwick with Jeff and I doing part time one again on uh, grade 91. And this is a grade 91 billet with some, something horrible happening in the middle with lots of macro segregation there. Uh, there's a chill zone here. But in this region, we're getting columnar grains. And you can see from this XRF map, it's primary dendrites and the very clear secondary dendrites, which are outlined in molybdenum, which is segregated. So we've got very clear micro segregation taking place here. This is a, a continuous cast for uh, a 91, although we see um, 91 being produced by ingot casting. The ones I'll look at later were sand cast uh, because they were shaped components, but you also see ESR processing as well because these are high value steels. So micro XRF can cover large areas. It shows micro and macro segregation, particularly if you can get as cast sample. Often you're not able to get cast sample because it's gone into some further processing. That, that's an issue in trying to separate out the casting from the subsequent processing effects on microstructure and properties. Um, it's a continuous process. It's got quite a large activation volume. Um, and so the effective step size is about 20 microns. And, and unfortunately, that can be the width of the solute rich region. So although we can see um, quantification, what tends to happen is that the peaks tend to get smeared out. You get some smearing of the signal from solute rich with the solute poor. So it doesn't pick the extremes, which are generally what we're most interested in the profile. There's also the, the perennial issue of taking a 2D section of a three dimensional structure. And therefore, how do you ensure that um, what you're going through is a center of dendrite to center of dendrite plane, not cutting partly through a dendrite or into dendritic region. Covering a large area, so it would be reasonable to assume that in this case, we were, uh, we were somewhere hitting that situation. But if you were to do line scans, then you've got a much smaller number. So. People do SEM, EDS line scans. They're not sure which part they're going through. So that needs much more care. Um, generally, they don't do enough to, to, do, to get the statistics right. And that then leads to the statistical approaches of ranking from a large number. Fleming Scungor 
starting with some element, single elements shorting uh, and then that's been developed to um, sort of Peter Lee's Wurz approach. Uh, and that works by going to the SEM, SEMEDS, so we now got a, a resolution of a micron, um, and then putting a large number of points, die, more results from Dayu, she did 400 points and make sure that the points are separated by at least the secondary dendrite arm spacing. Um, so you can either measure that or if you've got some simulations or thermal profiles, then you can estimate what the secondary dendrite arm spacing will be. Um, here are some measurements from a, a directional solidification rig that was at Birmingham, probably still is, um, but these are direct thermocouple readings for solidification. So we get the solidification and the cooling through the solid state. But from the solidification rate, that's this cooling rate here, we can use uh, the one and Thomas um, equations to predict the secondary dendrite arm spacing and subsequent work, including some by Adam, is starting to show that, that still applies not just to the carbon manganese steels that they were developed for, but also uh, seems to account for the variation in secondary dendrite arm spacing with cooling rate for the nine chrome. Uh, and then from those 400 points, you get composition values and you can then rank them. This is ranked on manganese because most of these are carbon manganese grades with some niobium and vanadium in one or two of them. So you get this ranking and you're making the assumption that the lowest value you get comes from the dendrite center and the highest value comes from the interdendritic center and there's a steady relationship between the two and that's not always the case as you move to more complex systems. So segregation is important, it's been known about for a long time, so actually trying to model it is something that started very early um, and it started when the, the level of data that were available were much restricted, where the computing power was very much reduced. So these represent very good attempts um, over the years to try and model the different aspects in segregation. And because they're, they're analytical equations, they're always good to try as a first stab just to see whether segregation looks as though it's going to be significant. Uh, the Shile analysis is included in quite a few commercial software. I know Thermocalc has a, a Shile and it has a modified Shile which allows the interstitials to, to diffuse. Uh, Shile has no, no diffusion in the solid state, whereas the subsequent ones, Brodie Flemings, Klein Kurtz, and Onarka, introduce different amounts of back diffusion during solidification not so much during cooling after solidification uh, and that's introduced through this alpha parameter and then the omega parameter and the beta parameter but they're based on the diffusivity of the species in the solid phase be it PCC or FCC. The other parameter that relates the instantaneous to the solid composition at the interface to the bulk composition is the partition coefficient and that's the composition of the solid divided by the composition of the liquid um, and the fraction fraction solidified so that, those are all your parameters and and so the partition coefficient and diffusivity are used widely they are tabulated and you can find these for partition from fc uh, from ferrite to liquid austenite to liquid and diffusivity in the um, rep in those two solid phases, so ferrite and austenite. Um, you can see they differ, so there's much more segregation, partition to be precise, uh, for a, fer a ferrite stabilizer when austenite is a solid phase than when 
ferrite is a solid phase and vice versa for austenite statements. Well, that would be fine if they were truly constant, but this is uh, some work that Robert Daly did, who started looking at segregation in the nine crow series. Um, those values in the table are the values that are given here at the start of solidification. But during solidification, um, what uh, Robert did, did was take the equilibrium thermocount prediction, and which should apply at the interface between the solid and liquid, and then just run the um, solid over liquid to get the effective partition coefficient as a function of the uh, solid fraction. Uh, and cobalt and nickel are very well behaved, but chromium, molybdenum, vanadium, and to a lesser extent, manganese, show partition coefficients that decrease with increasing temperature, uh, increasing solid fraction, uh, and that corresponds to greater degrees of segregation. So the liquid is becoming more enriched in those phase, uh, those elements. And the partition of silicon and copper is reducing because those values are going closer to one. So why is that happening? Well, that's because we're going from a simple binary or ternary system up to something that may contain 14, 15 elements. And the segregation of one element has cross-element effects on the segregation of other elements. And you notice here, the ones that are segregating strongly are strong carbide and nitride formers. So the segregation, not shown here of carbon and nitrogen to the liquid, is dragging these elements with it. Manganese is a less strong carbide former, so the effect is less. There is a potential that if sulfur is segregating, then manganese will be dragged by the manganese sulfur bond, so the enthalpy effects towards the boundary, but copper can also form solid, uh, strong copper sulfur bonds. And so the fact that these go in separate directions would suggest that it's due to carbon and nitrogen and not due to sulfur. These are quite clean in terms of their sulfur and phosphorus contents. So that would also help explain that it's a, just a carbon and nitrogen effect. So in terms of modeling that, we can't reliably use the um, analytical approaches. We have to use a numerical approach in terms of the interactions and partition coefficient. But when we come to diffusion in the solid state, that is as was drummed into me as an undergraduate, movement of the species down an activity gradient, not a composition gradient. In single phase simple systems, binaries, they're the same thing. But once you go to higher order systems, then it's the activity gradient. And so we know that silicon produces uphill diffusion of carbon because it affects the activity. And we've seen on the previous slide the activity changing the partition coefficient through the bond energy effects. So we need to use mobility. The software of choice for me is Dictra, but there are other ones that will deal with that. Uh, and therefore we need to move to these numerical approaches for modeling segregation. Um, this is some uh, work from Adam, where we're actually looking at how good are these approaches. So we've got Shile, um, before we plunge into numerical ones, Shile, Brody Flemings and the others. Um, for chromium and vanadium, they actually work quite well. So that's suggesting that diffusion isn't that great. But when we come to molybdenum, it doesn't work as well. So there isn't a, a system that fits, or an empirical approach, an analytical solution, that fits all of the elements. So it's not just diffusion, because that would ex explain these two, but not this one. And it's not just extra um, partition, because that would explain these two, but again, not that one. So we need for all of these elements, which are important to performance, to consider them together, and therefore it's a numerical method. 
numerical methods are fine, but they have some, we need some simplifications and assumptions. So the nine chromes, as I say, contain a lot of alloying elements. They also contain a lot of phases. We have to reduce these to improve the stability um, of the uh, simulation. So break up the the solidification, cooling, reheating into different temperature regimes where we can make assumptions about the phases and also reduce the number of elements that we consider. We don't consider phosphorus and sulfur, for example. Um, for simpler systems, DICTRA works very well. So DIU was able to simulate solidification and cooling all the way down to a few hundred degrees centigrade. Um, and so there's solidification, there's um, the peritectic, there's formation of the, the austenite backwards, and then there's the solid state transformation, which is key to getting this low area here in terms of the data set. So, so that works very well. Unfortunately, it doesn't work quite so well with um, running all of them in a single simulation for uh, the nine chrome system. And in nine chrome system, when we deal with just solidification, so this is partially solidified, so I've got liquid, austenite from the peritectic, and delta from the initial solidification. This is nitrogen, which is low in um, delta, reasonably constant in the liquid, and then varies through the uh, austenite. That's reasonably straightforward. Carbon behaves the same way. If we take uh, austenite stabilizers, which are substitutional, then they show more of a profile. So we have this profile through delta goes down to interfacial equilibrium with austenite, profile through the austenite, and then into the liquid. Uh, and on full solidification, we'll end up with a nice smooth curve. Plateaus at the top, comes down here. Really fun ones are um, the ferrite stabilizers. So there's some reduced partition because this is delta ferrite, so greater solubility for things like tungsten and chromium. Raising up the interface with austenite, dropping down, and then greater partition when the peritectic forms because they're rejected into the liquid. But that leaves us with this trough. So that traps this ferrite stabilizer substitutional alloying elements in the interdendritic liquid. Then you have a trough and then it comes up and then it comes back down again through that originally delta solid. Um, if we try and use XRF to show that, we don't see the trough. Um, I was being very optimistic when I said, although very weak, I don't think there's a real trough there now. Um, so that needs to go to SEM EDS, and that's work in progress. But we can use that for modeling. So we have the trough, so these are substitutional ferrite stabilizers, substitutional austenite stabilizers, and the interstitials. And the interstitials are quite uh, cunning because they desegregate at sort of 1300 degrees C, but on cooling, the enthalpic bond energies drag them back. So they resegregate. So instead of getting a nice flat um, profile, as I showed earlier for nitrogen, we get this profile going in. And so on tempering, um, these are stabilized for machining because they're at Brittle Marm site as cast. So they're, they're tempered at plus six, seven hundred degrees C. We get precipitation here. And if we go to SEM, we can see precipitation of tungsten rich outlining the segregation profile. So this is a nice uh, indirect measure of the segregation profiles in the as cast and in this case stabilized. After stabilizing, there may be uh, thermomechanical processing if it's uh, pipe or forging, or in this case, it's a shaped casting. So there's only thermal processing. So it's then given a normalization treatment, which is 1,000 to 1,250 degrees C, depending on alloy. Um, 
And what we see here are the substitutional alloying elements, cobalt on reheating to 1200 and holding for up to 16 hours. Uh, so just getting to temperature doesn't do very much on reheating. Same for tungsten and chrome, a little bit of an effect here, but nothing else. Um, the uh, interstitials which had precipitated are released into solution and then resegregate, as I previously mentioned. And then we come to what's the effect of holding, in this case at 1200 for 16 hours, and cobalt, again, very resistant to desegregation, but chromium coming down from 13 to 10 and a half, tungsten from four plus, more than four to 2.8. So we're in, at the end of this treatment, we've got a much more uniform material. So we can use thermal treatments to reduce the effects. This will stop resegregation of carbon and nitrogen to a large extent and give a much more uniform microstructure in terms of grain size, martin size, lath size, and precipitate. So we end up with a product that behaves more uniformly, which is effect effectively what we want. So as I said, um, prevention is better than cure. So can we reduce the amount of segregation? And that's the latest thing I've been working on. So um, for other reasons, we can't get rid of the per peritectic entirely. But if we carefully manipulate it, then we can reduce that extra segregation of the ferrite stabilizers when astonite forms. We won't minimize the composition, but we minimize the extent at which we get high composition. So it becomes much more easy to heat treat. Uh, and this is what happens. This is what I showed previously. So this is a standard alloy where you've got extensive macro segregation and you can see micro segregation here as well. Um, when I change the composition, much less macro segregation, which is a useful accident because I didn't design that, but reduced micro segregation. So we can design out the segregation. If there's any left, then there's a potential for heat treatment to deal with that. So in summary, overrun by far too much, but um, ideally all the processing history needs to be considered. Consider, ask yourself the question, is it likely to affect either downstream processing or properties? And if it does, how do you account for that in your characterization? How do you deal with it if you want to solve that problem? Um, and just the acknowledgement that this is lots of other people's work that I've pulled together. Um, lots of PhDs and postdocs at Birmingham and, and WMG. Uh, I've mentioned some through the talk and there are a few others that um, I haven't included particularly their, their results uh, explicitly, but did contribute. And also talking to people like Carl, Jeff and Claire um, has been very useful. Also, um, this is still being funded, particularly for the nine chrome through uh, EPRI with Jeff and I, uh, RD, RWE are supporting Adam Story's PhD, uh, and Innovate UK through the implant project are allowing me to model segregation and heat treatment. And that's it. Thank you. So when when we come to this uh, quantification of uh, either microstructural features such as grain size or precipitates. Uh, how do we know that how many number of images do we need to take and um, or what are the other ways of bulk quantification methods or something? Uh, the, um, the standard would be 2000 grains. OK, um, if you look at the ASTM standard, uh, partly it depends on, on the, the sorts of materials that you're looking at because that would be 4,000 grains to do the distribution of uh, solute rich and solute poor. Uh, if you look, if you can remember Debelay's um, distributions, they were very smooth. 
So the measure that I take is that if you have uh, a smooth distribution, then you've got enough grains. If you have a jerky distribution, then you haven't sampled enough grains. And so it, it, it will depend on, on what your grain size is as to how much of an area you need to measure. But if you're trying to work out whether you've done enough, then that distribution will, the smoothness of distribution will give you that information. And a lot of times, if you see this uh, precipitates uh, analysis, quantification methods, most of the time people uh, do TEM of several images and then they extrapolate to per centimeter square or something which comes to like 10 power 9 or 10 power 10, even though they have seen only few number of uh, uh, precipitates uh, within a small size of TEM sample. So what's your uh, um, uh, comment on that? Like, I mean, is it the reliable way of that extrapolation or that is what we have, so we adopt to that system? Well, uh, yes, TEM has always been less reliable in terms of volume fractions in terms of composition and size then yes you can get those um, if you look at enough foils so um, Shahid's distributions were pretty smooth so uh, you'd have confidence in the size and the number density um, is soluble because you can measure the thickness of the foil and therefore particularly if you've got a fibbed foil, which is more uniform thickness, then that becomes a more reliable number. You also tend to get more area to look at than in a jet polishing. So, so that's, um, that's a useful way. So I, I would have far more confidence in the number density and volume fractions that you're getting from uh, a fibbed thin foil I would have confidence in the composition and the phase for extraction replicas, but not the area fraction and uh, uh, well, all the number density because you you have much less confidence in what volume you've extracted from, and you also lose at the top and bottom end, so the ends of the distributions tend to be lost as well. Okay, thank you, um, Just. Nice to see you. You have any questions? Yeah, nice to see you, <laughs> Prakash. Uh, thank you, uh, Martin, for the very nice presentation. Uh, I had a question uh, that I agree, that I think yeah, that's right. That uh, if you look at large and large areas, uh, that that is particularly of very uh, yeah, it's of importance and very interesting feature of your presentation. The question is, uh, did you also check the influence of strain in the after process on on large scale distribution? Yes, that that was some of the work that some of the other students did. So uh, I've concentrated okay. on the segregation and casting stage, uh, a little bit on reheating. Uh, but Amrita looked at recrystallization rates and related that to grain size distribution and composition. So, so uh, we're we're covering more of that subsequently in terms of what's when well, start easier because segregation is probably the easiest has the longest persisting effect. But uh, that will give strain partitioning in rolling. You'll get friction effects. So you've then got a strain partition as well as a composition profile and, and potentially a temperature profile as well. So yes, it gets very complex very quickly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I absolutely agree. So thank you very, very much for interesting uh, presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, you know, I, this is work that I know quite a bit about. <laughs> so, uh, I, I sometimes feel it would be unfair to, uh, to ask. <laughs> Questions, but you know exactly what to ask because yeah. you know the work. <laughs> well, there there is that, I suppose. But I do have um, one question to allow Martin to comment on it. I think, and that's about not necessarily in the in the P ninety one grades, but as a general point that we talk about segregation um, and how important it is, which I fully agree with you. However, I was wondering if you can comment on 
where you see the influences of changing disruptive processing conditions. So, for example, using um, different casting technologies so that you could have finer spatial distribution of segregation. Um, that compared to, say, the, the rolling reductions or forging reductions to, to change those spacings, because it is the spacing of that segregation as well as the magnitude. Um, but of course, you might change it at different points in that processing route. So perhaps you can comment on how you see those factors interplaying. Um, I know there's no single right answer, but, but perhaps some views would be interesting. Um, yes. Um... I mean, the work that, that Faye did with us was showing the importance of scale in in the abnormal grain growth behaviour. So if you can reduce the scale, the spatial scale of the uh, of the inhomogeneity, then you will end up with a more uniform behaving structure uh, and the consequences of the inhomogeneity can then become uh, tolerable. So I think the issues would be if you're um, increasing the cooling rate to reduce the secondary dendrite arm spacing, you tend to then get more solute trapping. So that there will be a trade off between the scale of the cast structure and the amplitude of the composition profile. So I think there's a there will be an area where a range of cooling rates will be much more useful and therefore it won't give you a fine enough structure but you've got such enrichment that actually you get phase precipitation which is always the issue um, which you then can't readily dissolve and you you permanently effectively permanently lose solute so i think yes going to other casting processes would be beneficial um, whether you can then use those and retain the thermomechanical processing benefits or if you're going to casting thinner sections you can't reduce the, the composition uh, can't reduce the, the thickness as much and therefore you lose that benefit of refinement um, which I, I guess is maybe what you were behind was behind your question. Yeah, I think it, I think it is. I think it becomes just that interesting point of discussion, and it's why there's no single right answer. That if you've got grades that are more driven in their properties by heat treatment, then you might you might be able to tolerate going to a different, or faster cooling technology to make the finer scale. Mm. Uh, distributions that that provided you're absolutely right that you're not um, so solute heavy that you're going to have differences of um, phases you can't then get rid of that you can you can then use heat treatment to effectively homogenize because your diffusion distances are smaller and then there'll be other grades where you can't tolerate that approach because you have to put in the thermomechanical deformation to refine other microstructural parameters grain size or whatever it might be but i think it's a really such an important one to be uh, talked through for every steel and processing route combination so that you, you don't miss a trick in what is it that we can change it's not always composition mm -hmm. it's not always processing it's always between between the two yes and, and i think we're in a position where we can do that what if I mean, it, it was relatively easy for getting rid of the segregation in the nine chrome because it was a cast component. So um, there wasn't going to be what happens on on um, thermomechanical processing. Uh, but yeah, the the tools are there that we can, with reasonable confidence, say, okay, if we tried this approach it would or would not be beneficial within the, the errors that we, we have to accept. Uh, and so, yes, I think that that would be um, some nice things to do in our spare time. <laughs> Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you.
any questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm lucky that Harry had to go and give a tour. <laughs> yeah. Um, students, yeah, Natalia, yeah, please. Yeah, um, so just, hello, Martin. Um, I was one of your students back in Birmingham uh, in 1990, so uh, I thought I'd best just ask you a question. <laughs> um, going back to your original talk topic, um, how far back do you think does really matter? How far upstream? Um, I, I think that an assessment needs to be made of the liquid to solid state. Okay. Uh, and on the basis of that assessment and what properties you're after then determines whether you need to pursue it. Okay, it, we used, so um, after leaving university, I went to work in the steel industry for five years and made steel. Um, and one of the things when we were making ultra important grades such as tire cords, we were even worried about the grades that had previously been made in a ladle in the steel plant mm. before making the grade that was the critical grade to make sure that there was no aluminum contamination, to make sure that we were looking at inclusions um, and that sort of thing. So it was just another aspect um, of sort of experience. Yes. Yeah, that, that's more getting into to Zushu's area. Um, so I'm really considering um, how far we need to consider, go back in terms of a physical metallurgy. So once you've got the composition, um, but uh, as, as I said, for the, for the nine chrome, you do see air melts and vacuum melts and they have quite different inclusion composition. So yes, you're, you're right. Mm -hmm. uh, for it was, it was for doing, critical it... grades, you need to consider yeah, what ores are you using? What interstitial uh, and tramp elements are coming from the ores and the feedstock? Yeah, it, it was down to uh, the inclusions. So, um, we, and then inclusion modification as well, calcium injection in secondary steel making, things like that that would change your. And if we always had a saying that if we didn't get it right in the ladle, there was no hope further yeah. down <laughs> for everybody else that was processing it. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, if no more further questions, I would like to once again. Thank you, uh, Martin, for your time and wonderful talk. And thank you all.